Just a news flash, we're about a month away from Easter, the high point of the Christian year. Pretty fun, huh? That's what you have to look forward to. Next week, we're kind of in an in-between phase of, of sermons. It tags on to this sermon series, but it moves us towards the next one quite easily on generosity and stewardship, that general topic. And then we're walking towards the cross from there on for the three weeks following. But this week, we're closing out our sermon series uh, that I entitled Multiply, with a sort of focus behind it of generosity. And uh, Brian Johnson, our director of church planting for our conference, started us on this uh, unknowingly, on this theme of multiply, when he talked about uh, our part in planting a church. And um, we've since talked about small groups. Um, And we've talked about hospitality, and now we end with identity. And you might be wondering what that has to do with generosity. We'll get there, so don't worry about it. It'll take till the end, so, you know, don't hold your breath. We'll get there. But today we are talking about identity, and, and largely I'm talking about corporate identity more than, excuse me while I readjust this, um... As much as we're talking about individual identity, in fact, probably more, corporate identity, us as a church. And so if you'll indulge me, I don't often do this, but I'm going to read a little bit from a book at the beginning and the end. Um, It'll be a little bit longer than a paragraph. But if you can listen, uh, that would be good because I think it informs and frames where we're going. This is a book called World Impacting Churches. I've really appreciated this book by James Ebby. And he says it's a chapter entitled A Tale of Two Churches. He says, let me tell you a simple but true story of two churches. In some ways, these two churches are similar, but in other ways, they are vastly different. The first church is an ordinary church. There are thousands of churches like it all over the world. Ordinary churches normally make no significant impact on and have little influence in the cities, towns, and villages where they are located. In fact, they often do not influence much of anything. They're ordinary churches. But the second church I wish to describe is enormously different. It is what I call a Great Commission church. There are not many of them around, but they are powerful in that they make a genuine difference for Christ in their spheres of influence. They challenge their cultures, win many people to Jesus, successfully disciple new believers, effectively minister to the needs of their communities, plant new churches, help reach those who have not heard, and make the world a better place to live. Here's the story of the two churches. I'll read about the ordinary church. The first church is found in one of the world's major cities. For 15 years, the congregation had been meeting in a particular part of that city. Not much of significance was happening. Few people were being won to Christ in the church's neighborhood, and no effective outreach ministries to the community were in operation. The members met in a church building, but not one of good quality. One day, this church was offered the opportunity to buy a nicer church building, which was located in a totally different part of the city. And I'll shorten this. They moved to that other part of the city. After moving to the new location, the pastor wanted to discover what impact his congregation had made on the community where they had previously been located for 15 years. So he developed a plan The members went door to door. They asked a specific set of questions when trained to ask that. And then the church leadership tallied the answers to the questions in order to to determine the church's impact on their former neighborhood. Do you know what they found? They found that the church had made no measurable impact at all. For 15 years, they had met regularly in that community, but largely they determined to no avail. The leaders came to understand, in fact, that the people of the area had not even realized the congregation had moved out of their community to a new location. Perhaps, if that were the case, the community was never really conscious that the church was there in the first place. This church knew or practiced little which would help bring the transforming power of God's kingdom into its community. They were just an ordinary church. And as we said, the world is full of them. Finally, he says about an ordinary church, he says, ordinary churches regularly have a limited and rather self-centered view of ministry. They tend to live with a maintenance mentality, focusing on their own members and having little heart for the world around them. They have not understood that Jesus came to seek and to save lost people and that he has commissioned his followers to do likewise. 
Now, that's, that seems like it's a downer way to start, right? An ordinary church. But I think it frames where we're going. Because the question can be asked, what happens if we lose sight as a church of our mission and our identity? That's what happens. I think he's pointing it out. And, and my contention this morning is when we understand our identity, we can fulfill our mission. Very simple. So turn or find on your mobile device Colossians 1, 24 through 20, well, Colossians 1, 24 and following. This is Paul's identity that he brings up. Starting at verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Rejoicing and suffering is what Paul is putting together. Quite often, I don't know about you, but those don't seem to go together to me. You don't suffer with joy unless a couple things are true, I think. You don't suffer with joy, first of all, unless you believe very strongly in something, in that, that which you're suffering for. In fact, suffering is, is not easier in that instance, but it's possible in the way Paul's talking about. In order to suffer with joy, you have to believe there's something worthy of suffering for, a goal of some kind. And the other thing is, you don't, it's not just that you believe in something, but you have to have some perspective and you have to have had some kind of experience that brings that. And I think Paul, we don't read it here, but Paul has, has had a personal experience with the risen Jesus Christ. And that changes his whole identity and his whole outlook on life. And so now he's, in, he's contending for Jesus Christ and for his church. And he'll suffer with joy. And he says, I have a commission from God to do this. That's verse 25 we just read. He says, I have become its servant, that is the church's servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word in all its or in its fullness. Paul at some point in his life had an identity shift, right? Paul had been one of the big attackers of Christianity and of the church, and now he identifies with Christians and the church. I mean, how does think through that identity shift? That's, that's massive, isn't it? That Paul at one point was uh, opposed to everything Jesus and opposed to the church, and now he's the greatest laborer for the church, rejoicing in his suffering as he does work for the church. What makes that kind of a switch? And it was, as I thought through this, I thought of examples of, of where we've had maybe, you know, I don't know, I couldn't think of great examples of, of moving from, you know, that deep of a, a switch, but for a lot of us, we've had experiences where something was, we were indifferent or un unknown, something was unknown to us, but we made a switch, like a family member gets cancer all of a sudden, that which was sort of something we were indifferent to or, or was something out there is now real. In our own family, somebody being born with a physical disability, all of a sudden that changes how we think of things, that changes your identity, and the person who's gone through cancer, the person who has a, a disability or whatever it is, that shapes their identity, right? And it can change your identity significantly. Something gets personal, just like it did for Paul. All of a sudden, it was personal. It shifted his identity in a big way. So he's there, a commission to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Go on to verses 26 and 27. This is what it is. He says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. To them, we have that. That's Israel. That's through the Old Testament. God is presenting to a group of people what he's going to make known, this mystery. And all of a sudden now, this mystery is fully and completely open to everybody else. Gentiles, that's all of us, right, in the room. The ethnicities, that's kind of what it translates as in Greek, to ethne. And the mystery, all of a sudden, is open to everybody. It's not a secret, it never was. So don't, don't go that direction with thinking the mystery. It was clear that there was a hope 
throughout the Old Testament. It was never a secret, but it was mysterious. It was cryptic at times. The plan was anticipated in the past, but never fully revealed. As Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 points out, it'll be on the screen. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. By the way, this is a really hard verse in Greek to translate. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And skip to verse 3. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. What was once shadowy and mysterious now has become realized in Jesus Christ. The mystery is revealed and it's open to all. And, and we can easily look back on this and we can say, well, yeah, we get it now, right? Hindsight's 20, 20. But, but when Israel waited in those days, there was a genuine mystery about this. What's this going to look like? Who's this, what's, what's this going to be when God reveals all this stuff? And even when Jesus came, there's a lot of mystery about it. But no longer. God chose a people by whom he would reveal his plan for the redemption of all creation. Now the plan is revealed and everybody's invited to the party. That's the mystery revealed. And there are glorious riches and treasure uh, as a part of that. The plan is Jesus Christ, Paul says. The glorious riches are found there too, Jesus Christ. Paul spe says specifically, you want to know this mystery of God? It's Jesus, plain and simple. And within that person, we get this treasure and the riches. As he says in, in chapter 2, verse 3, those are wisdom and knowledge that come from Jesus Christ. There's something to be found there, this mystery revealed. And that's where Paul finds his identity. Paul finds his identity in, in the commission to deliver all of that news to the church and to the world. And I want to give you two sort of points of application for us from that this morning, and then I want to round out this sermon series with a thought. And the first is this. Know your identity. I'm talking individually, but I'm also talking corporately. Right, as the church, we have to know our identity. When you understand your identity, you can fulfill the mission. When we understand it as a church, we can fulfill the mission that we've been sent on. Paul has an identity shift in life, and it's significant, very significant. It shapes everything about who he is and what he's doing. But we could ask the same about ourselves. What shaped your identity? What has shaped my identity? You know, I brought up before when somebody goes through, let's say, cancer or, or, or those kinds of uh, medical and physical experiences, or, or in our own family, somebody being born with a disability, it changes a lot about how we understand who we are, right? I, uh, just to back up a little bit from such a, a weighty example, I guess uh, I knew of a pastor who, and there are plenty of them out there, who didn't share personal stories in his sermons because he had been wounded too many times by people bringing them up, right? It shapes our identity, what we go through in life shapes who we are and who we become. So here's an identity test based on what Paul said. Answer this question, and I had a hard time phrasing this question, so all of you grammarians in the room can come up to me later and written on a paper, and um, I can ignore it then. What is something that you believe in so strongly that you could have joy in suffering? There's your identity test. What is something that you believe in so strongly that you could have joy in suffering? Or that you could endure joy in suffering? See, we don't like suffering in our part of the world, do we? Not really. Now we, we're, we're, and, and I don't frankly like suffering either. I had a headache this morning. What did I do? I took Tylenol. I don't like suffering either. And we read about people suffering for the gospel and we'll say, Wow! That's amazing. I hope that never happens to me. Right? It only took me a little time of being a, a hospital chaplain to realize that pain is often treated as an enemy, and it's not always the enemy. It's, it's, it's in fact, pain and suffering are, are profoundly shaping experiences that none of us want, but when you have them, they change you, don't they? Pain and hardship are shaping forces. We even read that in Romans this morning, Romans 5. And we'll go through pain and hardship for things we believe in, right? I held up a phone earlier. How many days will people wait in line to get some of those new phones? In good weather or bad weather, we'll endure some suffering and hardship if we believe in it, right? 
So the identity test, what would you suffer for joyfully? You have an identity. I have an identity, whether or not we can pinpoint it or not. And, and the places where we expend our energy reinforce and shape those identities, just like it does for Paul. So you have to know your identity, first of all, but then you have to trust your identity and follow through with where it takes you. And here I'm, I'm moving more corporately, for sure. Follow through with what you believe. Paul does it. Paul puts in the effort necessary. In fact, chapter 1, verse 29, Paul says, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me to fulfill that mission that he's talking about, the commission he's gotten. He, can, he strenuously contends. Different translations have different ways of saying it, but that word contend or strive is an athletic term for a fight or a contest in Greek. And that's what he's saying. I, and and let's, let's take this to a, a modern and simple example. Do you ever watch a kid when they're at the stage in life, a baby, when they're at the stage in life, they're trying to get on hands and knees, right? What are they doing? They're putting all their energy into trying to just do that one little thing, right? And then as they get a little older, they're putting all their energy into trying to crawl and then all their energy into walking, which soon turns into running, which soon turns into crashing into things, Right? all of their energy goes towards that one thing. And as we get older and as we add years to that, we put a little less energy into certain things unless we believe so strongly in it that we'll contend like Paul says. Those are your two things. Know your identity. And you can say that individually and then follow through with it. Where are your energies really put? But as a church, we need to know our identity, and then we need to really analyze where do we put those and expend those energies in following through with what our identity is. And so let me connect a little bit of generosity and identity as we've looked at this series. If you go to Colossians 1, verse 6, which is beyond the scope of what we read this morning, this will be new material for you. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord... Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. The Colossian church was potentially dealing with some identity issues, if we're to read this right. Paul's saying, be careful of what's out there. Someone or something either is or could tell them to be something other than they are through hollow and deceptive means. There, there's somebody or something saying, look this way, act this way, be this way. Something else other than your identity, the one you were taught. Without a solid identity, we run risks. Now, uh, all of us have an identity. The church has an identity. And the thing is, the world around us has identities as well, and, and it doesn't stop moving. There's always something changing around us, and so we always have to take our identity and adapt to the world we live in. There's just no question about that. There's always moving parts. But we can adapt and forego your identity in many ways and say, well, I'm just going to cave into what's around me, or you can adapt and remain steadfast in your identity. I know who I am, and I know where I am, and I know the world around me is spinning and doing other things, and it may be good, it may be bad, but I'm not going to give up who I am because of that, and I'm not going to change just because of that, right? Individually, one place where, where often this gets seen, I think, uh, most profoundly in, in just individual life is workplace versus home life, right? You go to the workplace in some cases, um, and the joking is different than at home, and do you laugh or do you not? It might not be appropriate. I don't know if you've run into those cases. I don't in this work environment, typically, but I have in others. But the church can be the same way. Do we laugh at the jokes the world is telling? Do we cave into the way the world is saying we should be? It's no different for identity. And, and in this sermon series, we've covered a few things. We've covered church planting, we've covered groups, and we've covered hospitality. I think all of those things should be a reflection of our identity as a church. And around us, there are hollow and deceptive philosophies being thrown at us all the time as the church that we can give into 
if we're not careful. Only 4 or 5% of churches ever plant another church. We had a beginning date. None of us remember it because we weren't alive then. We had a beginning date, and guess what? We were also supported financially by other people outside of the church. This church had to ask for financial support from the very beginning from other churches. Only 4 to 5% of churches ever are generous in this area to start other churches. They start and they just assume other churches will figure it out. Gathering together in small groups, I've talked about that. You can do that in multiple ways in the church, and in fact, it happens in every church, right? People will gather together in small groups. We're being intentional about what types of small groups we want to gather together, is what we are. And that's an identity-shaping piece for us. That defines who we are as a church, that we're distinctly and intentionally gathering together to grow in our fellowship and in our learning together. And most churches, if we're talking hospitality, and I've been to a lot of them, assume that they are hospitable, but they put very little effort into really being hospitable. We've got to be intentional about that. And the the issue is we worship a generous God. But often it's easy as the church to act like hoarders in light of our generous God. Well, we've got all this stuff. We better keep it. And we we can be good stewards, but sometimes we can also hide behind that if we're not careful. God is generous. Amen? That was weak. God is generous. Amen? Amen. You're still with me. His people, the church, should be that way as well. The mystery that Paul speaks of is Jesus Christ, the greatest act of generosity ever. You won't find one that's parallel. And the church, whether worldwide or the church local, is asked to bring that gift in a meaningful way to those who do not yet know the full scope of God's generosity. What are we doing with that gift? That's the question. What's our identity say about what we do with that gift, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God revealed? Let me read to you about an extraordinary church then. We read about the ordinary church, and there are lots of those. Abby says, an extraordinary church. James Abby says, the story of our second church is different, hugely different. This is a church which is also located in one of the world's major cities. In some ways, it looks to the untrained eye, much like the church just described. But a closer look at this congregation reveals that it is, in fact, vastly different. This church impacts its community at a deep level. Hundreds of people from the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods are being won to Christ. Baptisms take place on a weekly basis. New converts are discipled to become powerful followers of Jesus. A number of prostitutes, drug addicts, and gang members have become followers of Jesus. Several of their members formerly spent time in prison, but had their lives totally changed through the power of the gospel. Some had been gang leaders and some involved in organized crime. Several of these former leaders in crime have become leaders in the church. The church also has numerous effective outreach ministries to the poor, to gangs, and to prostitutes in their neighborhood. In addition, they are learning about the unreached peoples of the world and are beginning to gain a heart for reaching those who have not heard. This church is, in fact, so influential in its community that the mayor of the city came on one occasion to present the church with an award, and he thanked them for reducing the crime rate and making the city better. Abby asks this question, which of these two churches would you like your church to be like? I've asked this question in meetings with pastors and church leaders all over the world. Not once have I seen a leader who wanted his church to be like the first church described. No, we all want to be a part of something significant. We want our churches to make a genuine difference in the world. The mystery revealed is Jesus Christ, and there are hollow and deceptive philosophies out there that could pull us away from being generous with a gift that was the most generous gift of all. What kind of church do we want to be, and what's our identity? It's a good question, isn't it? I haven't said what it is. Don't read into what I'm reading from this book saying I think it's one or the other. But that's where we go from here. I've been talking about visioning, 
We're going to be we're going to be picking up on this even more this summer. But what kind of a church do we want to be? It all comes from what we believe about this mystery revealed and the generosity of God to us. I want to be a generous church. I hope you do too. Because God has been so generous with us. Let's pray. God, we give thanks for the fact that you were so generous with us by giving us your son, Jesus Christ, and we can never fathom the full depth of that generosity. God, it will be glorious when we stand before you someday and we can understand more fully what that means. Even now, it's a bit of a mystery, but God, help us as we find our identity in that which was mysterious and is now known, your son, Jesus Christ. And as we seek to take that mystery out into the world, that others would know that it wouldn't be a secret, God, but that it would be known and known to all, just as you've made it known to us. God, continue to change us and shape us in your image, both individually and as a church. And help us as we do the same in our community with all the opportunities before us. We pray this all in the name of your Son who loved us so much. Amen.